It's been a while since I sat in front of this computer. I promised myself I would stop typing about him, stop thinking about him, stop giving him life. Sharing his story spreads his fear. It helps him grow. So that's why I haven't been updating you guys. But now, uh, things have changed. Things have gotten so much worse. I have to go now. On a mission I likely won't make it back from. But it's my only hope. If we fail, no one is safe. If I don't make it, and the world begins to burn, then I want at least people to know what happened, and that we tried. Ten months ago, I visited a retreat in Alaska for 12 weeks. Officially, I was there to complete my mandatory park ranger general safety and rescue training, as stated in my employment contract. Unofficially, I was there to get myself away from Wolf Lake and Edward Dean Keller. In short, for those who haven't read my previous entries, Edward Keller was a piece of crap, and he hurt a lot of people, who even after his death, continued his reign of terror over this Colorado town. When he wasn't destroying families in their tents and snatching children into the woods, never to be seen again, then he was haunting my dreams, poisoning my mind with visions of his heinous things he had inflicted on the innocence of this world. One night, my gaffer Phil, Richard, and the Wolf Lake Sheriff bundled me into a car to get me out of town before that psychopath spirit could have his way with me, deep in the heart of Wolf Lake. Alaska was meant to clear my head, give me a cinch of normality so I could return to work with a free mind. Then I could follow the rules and keep Edward Keller at bay. The thing is though, it turns out Wolf Lake, Ed Keller, it's just one piece of a very dark and horrifying jigsaw. I learned through a clandestine group of rangers from other national parks that there are others out there. I heard stories that would make sleep impossible if I had not seen the stuff that I had already seen. It was clear to me now that the woods, wherever in the world, weren't safe. Something needed to be done. By the time that my plane landed in Denver, the snow had started to cover the highest peak of the Rocky Mountains, and the hardcore Christmas fiends had started to light up the town of Wolf Lake with light and tinsel. My cab made good time and within 40 minutes, I was pulling up that all-too-familiar dirt path and through the main gates of Wolf Lake National Park. It wasn't long after signing myself into the staff register in the visitor center that I was paying the driver and dragging my case through my cabin door. I stared at the room where I last saw Keller. My head began to pound and my temples started to burn. I closed my eyes in pain. I just want people to know that I'm back, James. It's no fun, you know, being stuck all by myself in these woods. No one to play with. No one to keep me entertained and satisfied. It's not good at all. His words flashed in my head and I nearly vomited from remembering that foul stench of rotting meat. It's why when you bring me some nice family, well, I get a little excited. I get a little carried away. <laughs> Kether's evil laugh rang in my ears as the vivid trauma from that night remained fresher in my mind than I could have ever imagined. Thankfully, Phil and I had taken up meditation on our 12 weeks away. We weren't converting to anything, but we decided that we needed to be able to clear our heads of darkness should we ever need to. It didn't always work, but it really depended on how bad the thoughts were. Thankfully, most of the time, I didn't let them get to the point of no return. Until now. As soon as the sun lit up the 395 square miles of woodland, I left my cabin, climbed on my now staff-issued ATV, and headed up to Phil's tower for a catch-up. He had been mysteriously called back to Wolf Lake around week 10 of our retreat, and was extremely sheepish about why he had to go alone. Smoke was coming out of the top of the tower when I had arrived. Not surprising, it was a cold morning, very cold. No snow on the ground as of yet, here in South Colorado, but it wasn't far away. 
I jogged up the stairs, half to reach the top quicker, and half to warm myself up. When I reached the bottom step of the final flight, I noticed the door was slightly ajar, and I also heard voices. I made sure to crouch so as to not be seen through the window. I got my ear as close to the crack of the door as I could. Richard, this can't go on. I don't know how many more cover-ups or sleepless nights I've got left in me. You have to pass it up the chain. We need a solution, whoever they are. They are growing in power. We're not safe anymore. It's only a matter of time. Phil's plea was filled with exhausted desperation. Oh, Phil, I assure you that I have and that's why Mr. Black is here from the agency. And also, Dan has his department on high alert, looking for anything untoward. Richard replied, Untoward? Richard mocked the phrasing with a scoff. Mr. Tench, if I may. The unknown agent interjected. It's Phil. Phil, my name is Miles Black. I've been sent here to be the boots in the ground here at Moflake. I can assure you that the agency is well aware of the hazards that are here, and at the other parks, and we are devising a plan to control it. I don't think you have any idea of what these hazards are, Mr. Black. You haven't seen the things that I have, Phil snapped. No, I haven't witnessed the entity that inhabits this particular park. Nor can I say I've witnessed the others at the other parks that we've spoken about. But what I can attest to is saying that I've witnessed a heck of a lot of my time at the agency. For you see, before we were reassigned, I was part of a unit known as Team X1. My ears perked up. I had read that name before. I tried quickly to recall where I'd heard it before it hit me. The Yellowstone Ranger who saw them hunting something, he heard them say it on the radio. If my interest wasn't piqued, it certainly was now. We were a specialized unit. Our typical objectives involved extremely close encounters with things that you don't exactly find on safari. We were deployed typically to track and study, but more often than not, we hunted these things. What sort of things? I heard Sheriff Farrar inquire. Well, predators. These sorts of things that you only hear about in campfire stories, movies, and your worst nightmares. Most cultures call them cryptids. Hunted down a trio of trapdoor spiders, the size of freaking horses, in the Amazon back in 08. Tracked more Wendigos than I care to remember, and I've found countless skinwalker victims. Well, what's left of them anyway? So no... I don't have a great deal of information about what is going on at these specific locations. But please, Phil, don't assume that I'm clueless. This is why we are here. To find out what we are dealing with, the agent explained. Okay, but if you guys are so plugged into these cryptids, then why is it the first time that we're meeting you, huh? Phil probed. It was a fair question, I thought. Because, as horrifying, violent, and malevolent as the things that I've seen are, they were physical beings. They walked on legs, they breathed our air, and they killed with their fangs and claws. The entities that occupy these black sites like Wolf Lake, Redwood, and Glaciers, the Appalachian, and Death Valley, well, they aren't exactly physical. They can't be tracked, hunted, or killed. And not by anything mortal, anyway. So what? You brought some immortal weapon with you or something? Phil mocked. There was a silence. I looked through the crack in the door and caught a glimpse of Richard and this Miles Black sharing an awkward look. They seemed to be deciding on how to answer. Well, there's something in the works, Miles began. I was so enthralled waiting for the rest of that sentence that I nearly crapped myself on my walkie-talkie crackled to life. I quickly scrambled, fumbling at my belt and turning off the radio before any more static came through. A few murmurs came from inside, before footsteps began to approach. 
The door swung open. Were you expecting anyone, Mr. Tench? Miles asked. No, I wasn't, Phil responded. I stood, frozen still, staring through the gap where the door hinged. As Miles, Richard, and Sheriff Farrar looked around. At one point, I could have sworn Richard looked right at me. I desperately controlled my breathing. Look, we have a part to run, so maybe we should leave Phil to rally the Rangers. Pick this up another time, Richard suggested. And I need to brief my guys that are missing person. Try to track these guys down, Farrar added. Okay, I need to make a few calls to HQ. But then Richard and I am going to need a couple of your guys to give me a tour of the park. Show me significant locations. I can do that. Me and my colleague James. I'll go get him from his cabin and we can meet you at the VC in around an hour. Phil suggested. Sounds good. Miles confirmed. Richard, the sheriff, and this Miles said their goodbyes and made their way down the stairs. As Phil waved them off from the balcony. I planned to let Phil go back inside, wait a few more minutes before knocking on the door. But as Phil made his way back into the cabin... Jesus Christ, get your butt in here, James, before you freeze those big ears of yours off. I couldn't help but chuckle. So, how you been? Phil asked, as he stirred the coffees that he had prepared for us. Irish, no doubt. Good, yeah, I've been good, Phil. But come on, let's not stand on ceremony. We need to talk about what just happened. Oh, you mean you eavesdropping on a private conversation? Phil act fictitiously. I chuckled away the criticism. How did you know I was there anyway? I asked curiously. You kidding? Besides you having a penchant for listening in on conversations that don't involve you. I saw you peeking through the door crack right before you leaned on the walkie. Not exactly James Bond, kid. Phil said, teasing me. I'll try to be more subtle next time. I replied with humor. No, we need to talk about the conversation that you just had, and the dozen conversations I had in Alaska with a number of the rangers. Phil looked at me confused. You better sit down, I invited, and he complied. He didn't say a thing, other than taking a large gulp of his beverage and allowed me to open up. So, all of those late night walks where you were clearing your head... You were having secret liaisons with a group of government whistleblowers. Phil's tone was no longer teasing, it was annoyed. Well, technically, they never blew the whistle, so... I don't care, Phil snapped, slamming his fist down on the coffee table. I was honestly startled. I didn't recognize the man that sat across from me right now. Jesus, Phil, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to lie. It's just they wanted no one to know. I explained to Phil as he held his face in his own hands. He sat upright, once again and composed himself. No kid, I'm sorry. It's just been a little intense here, Phil confessed. Intense? So what's going on? Is this why you had to come back early? Yes, he said with a heavy heart. Mark, he's missing. Atwood? Yeah. Richard says he started acting weird around four weeks after we left. Late for work, looking like he hadn't slept in days. No one could get him on the radio after hours. And then around two weeks ago, they found his cabin door wide open. His bed sheets thrown around the room. Blood and fingernail scratch marks leading out the door and into the woods. As soon as the trail got around five meters into the forest, it stopped dead. No more sign of Mark. So, with him gone, I became head ranger, Phil explained. I didn't tell you because you seemed to be doing good. I didn't want to, you know, trigger anything, he added. I gently nodded. Fair enough, I thought to myself. So, does anybody know what happened? Uh, to Atwood, I mean. I assume that's who Sheriff Farrar was talking about. Come on, kid. What happened was the same thing that would have happened to you if we hadn't turned up at your cabin that night. 
Phil sat with sorrow. I hung my head in sad acknowledgement. No, that's not who Ferrar was referring to. Phil's revelation snapped me upright in my seat. Then who? I asked. Alex Jessup, Phil revealed. It honestly took a few seconds before I realized the significance of that name. And when it hit me, boy, did my body go limp. The kid who... Got Keller arrested, yeah. Not a kid anymore, though. He's about 24. Phil informed, finishing my sentence for me. Well, what, uh, what happened? What are the police now? I inquired. Phil scoffed and began shaking his head, knowing the darkness of his next sentence. They found his apartment broken into. The phone line had been cut, too. Drag marks on the carpet leading from his bed out into the hallway and down the stairs to the front door. Smashed ornaments, it looks like the kid put up a fight. I'll give him that. There was a symbol painted on the mirror in his bedroom. That same symbol we found by Keller's tree that fateful night 17 years ago. The cult of Kettle Moraine, I thought out loud. Phil hummed in agreement. Why though? And do you think that it's linked to Atwood? I began to fire questions at Phil in a curious tangent. I have no idea. Part of me in all honesty doesn't want to, kid. But they went missing within the space of nine days of each other. This is the first ten of these people we've had in Wolf Lake since that night. I have no idea what they've been up to since, but whatever it is, it can't be good. Later that day, Phil and I took Miles Black on a tour of the park, showing him key locations when it came to Ed Keller. The Keller tree, the various holes where we found the children's clothing, the location of the Wendy Cartwright sighting, not to mention the far too many locations upon where I've had to cut down a butchered and mangled up couples from trees, praying that their insides don't splatter on me upon the impact when they hit the ground. He took notes, measurements, photos of everything, logging them all on some high-tech government-issued tablet. And trust him, not yet anyway. I didn't know enough about him to say it if I did, quite frankly. The feeling was mutual, however. His face was less than calm when Phil began talking openly about Ed Keller in front of me. This soon went away, however, when we filled him in on the past five months. If anything... I think he saw me as useful now. Okay, gentlemen. I think I have everything that I need. Apart from one thing, Miles said. What can we do for you? Phil asked, curious. You, James, he said, pointing the tablet at me. Me? Yes. Given how the thing that we are dealing with seems to attack initially in the dreams of its victims... We are at a disadvantage when it comes to scouting it. But you, on the other hand, you have seen it. You have information that is critical to this operation being a success. Miles informed us, almost sounding like a salesman pitching a potential customer. Oh, whatever I can do to help, I offered. I would like to sit down with you tonight in your cabin, just me and you. I want to ask you some questions and go through some tasks under certain conditions. Would that be okay? The emphasis that he placed on the word conditions made me wary. But what else could I say? 6 p.m. okay, he suggested. Uh, better make it 8. Miles didn't bother to ask why. By the time that Miles Black turned up at my cabin... The sun had already set and a blanket of dark velvet had set across the forest known to the locals as the Lake of the Wolf. Come on in, I invited. Miles nodded and made his way into my cabin. He hadn't arrived empty-handed. A large metallic briefcase hung from his right hand. I found myself staring at it, imagining the potential contents. Take a seat, please, Mr. Parker. Miles ushered me onto a chair at my kitchen table. Anyone would think I was a guest in this home, not the other way around. Miles or Mr. Black was a weathered man. 
he had either had a very hard 40s or an easy 55. His strong, cold, military appearance made me think twice of asking him to clarify his age. So, what's in the briefcase? I asked nervously. My question was completely ignored, which didn't aid my anxiety. I need you to tell me everything you can about the person or entity known as Edward Dean Keller. Milo's question was extremely formal and I assumed he was recording me. And I was right, he'd put his cell phone on the table, which had already been recording for the past 47 seconds. Anything at all, Miles added, prompting me to quit pondering him and answer his question. Okay, I said, steadying myself. Miles eyed me intently, eagerly awaiting my information. Around six months ago, I packed up what life I had to move from Atlanta to Wolf Lake in order to take this job. When I had arrived, I found newspapers in my cabin that were left over from a previous occupant. I started reading them. I saw an article about a boy who had vanished in these woods in 04. His name was Danny. Before his disappearance, he said that he saw a man. A man in the woods. Adults tried to find him, but there was no sign of anyone. The next day, the kid goes missing. A woman named Wendy Cartwright said that she saw a thing in the woods, around 20 miles from the last place the kid was seen. This thing, it was carrying a child. Said it was skipping or tiptoeing or something like that. Said that it looked inhuman, whatever it was. I looked into the disappearances further and I soon discovered that there were over 20 cases like this in Wolf Lake. Kids missing, family slaughtered, just awful stuff. At the time, there was another case like these going on. A family had gone missing, and we found the adults quickly. They were in pretty rough shape, hanging on tree branches next to each other, with their skin missing. The kids, well, little Riley and Ashley, we never found them. Just their undergarments. It was buried about half a meter underground. That night, I was on watching TV, and the sad just switched the channel to a news report of the missing kids. The remote was at the other side of the room at the time. The reporter makes a reference to a guy called Ed Keller, a psychopathic killer. It was like something was wanting me to know about him, and I can't really explain it. Anyway, I started to look into him deep. I began to see patterns and similarities between the crimes of Keller and the disappearances and the deaths here at Wolf Lake. I see. Please, Mr. Parker, please continue, Miles encouraged. The recording finished at 1 hour and 46 minutes by the time that I had filled Miles in and my dreams about Ed Keller and the resulting horror, such as what had happened to Chuck and his kids. In the interest of protecting the men from Alaska, I didn't mention the things that I had learned from my time there. I instead tried to get it from the horse's mouth. As soon as I've answered your questions, would you answer one of mine? Miles smirked and gently chuckled. It depends what it is. I smirked back. Come on, man. I've seen things that you haven't. I'm the only one at this park who has seen him and lived to tell the tale on tape. I think you can trust me with what I want to know. Miles nodded. Touche. I'll make a deal. You agree to play ball with what I have in this briefcase and I'll tell you anything you want to know. What do you say? I stared at the briefcase once again, wary of what could be inside. But not for the first time. My curiosity got the better of me. Okay. Who are you? Why have they sent you to deal with, well, whatever this thing is? Miles sighed, contemplating his response, blissfully unaware that I already knew the answer. I'm from a branch of the US government that you might say is like a parent group of the outfit that you know is hazard control. We don't really have a name, we are just referred to as the agency. We along with hazard control are responsible for maintaining order of the things that roam the earth that aren't exactly regular. Like aliens. I probed. Aliens, monsters, mutants, cryptids. 
anything unworldly that poses a malignant threat to the human race. I was the leader of an elite group of soldiers who would embark on missions to help contain these threats. Team 1X, the best of the best, he said with pride. So, where are the rest of you then? Why just send you? The rest of my team are out on other assignments. They are visiting other national parks where we've had reports of other issues. Other issues, I asked, trying not to let on that I already knew. People disappearing, lots of people. To the public, every disappearance is mysterious, but we know, you know. We know that it was a skinwalker in Yellowstone, the Wendigo in the Badlands, or even the 20-foot alligator that lurks in the Everglades. But the people who disappear at the black sites, we have no idea. We've heard some pretty disturbing reports from other rangers who, for the greater good, were silenced with money by hazard control upon instructions from the agency. Why is keeping the public in the dark about the danger part of the greater good? I asked with an edge of my tone. Miles, a hard man clearly desensitized by making the hard call on a daily basis, looked slightly annoyed at my brash question. No, oh, because it's not that simple. They aren't normal predators. We can't just cut off their food supply and wait for them to starve. We tried that once. The rangers began to drop like flies. The ones who didn't, they left their posts. Before we knew it, their families, their friends, they all turned up dead. And the rangers went missing too. Jesus, what happened? I mean, God, that's messed up. Death Valley 03. I'll never forget it. The amount of crap we had to cover up. We had to make it look like these men had gone mad from too much time in the woods. Killed the people they lived with and gone on the run. Naturally to a few people, it seemed a little far-fetched. A few journalists, a couple of PIs, you know. Most of them went away with the right amount of money, but unfortunately, a few needed a bit more of an aggressive approach. I chose not to ask him to elaborate on that, instead choosing to let him continue without interruption. Anyway, we eventually got it contained, hired some new rangers for that area and began paying them hazard pay. We made them sign NDAs as a part of the new policy for all national park rangers. Hey, we couldn't risk letting the rangers know what they were dealing with. So, that's when we formed Hazard Control Division and implemented an agent in each of the national parks. Most of them just sit around, looking all official, but we need an agent in every park in case another one of these things decides to pop up. The point is, kid, we need to make sure we keep these things contained where they are. Any incidents, they need to be sugar-coated for the public to digest without pandemonium spreading. Yeah, a few innocents will die, but the greater good is these things don't grow in power and kill a hundred or a thousand more. I mean, look what happened when you simply sparked a conversation about Ed Keller in an internet cafe. It took no more than 20 minutes for this guy to throw that back in my face, but ultimately, I saw his point. I nodded my head in shamed agreement. Okay, so here's my last question, I said. Casey and Miles to sit up an inch. Talking about the horrible things that these things and also his agency had done in 03 had caused him to slouch a little. Go on. If these things have been around since the late 90s, what's different today? What makes you think you can get rid of them now? Miles stared at me for a brief moment before he turned to the briefcase. He inserted a passcode into the keypad in the front of the case. A small beep was heard and the locks popped off. He only lifted the lid a few inches so I couldn't see the entire contents of it. He reached in and pulled out a thin blue binder. He placed it on the table and opened it up. A profile along with a photo of a man stared back at me. He was a scary looking individual. Beard down to his chest, thick black locks covering his face and broad shoulders. His stats said that he was 38, stood at 6'3 and weighed over 250. Not someone you want to owe money to anyway. This is Yubel, a real piece of work. 
once part of the cult of Kettle Moraine, except in 02 he was excommunicated for being too extreme. Imagine that, huh? A group of delusional Nats who kidnap young teens and butcher them in the name of some mythical goat. And this guy is too much. It boggles my mind, Miles said, almost lost for words. Wait, delusional Nats. These Kettle Moraine guys created these entities, right? They gave Ed Keller his life back, didn't they? I was a little lost. No, not exactly. You see, Yubel was a lot of things. Sociopathic, infatuated with power, but most importantly, he was influential. As Miles told the story, I continued to examine the file. Despite his youth, when they threw him out, a handful of the other younger and newer members were already taken in by his speak of, making the world bow at his feet. They followed him out of the cult. With Yubel as the leader, they formed a new group. One that was willing to do what the Kettle Moraine just fantasized about. The black-robed people they were to be commonly known by. As I turned the page, there were four more profile pictures. Older-looking men, aged roughly in their 50s. Something I picked up on it, though, brought my attention back to Miles. Sorry, you said was a lot of things. Is he dead? I inquired. Miles grinned slightly, it took a second to nod it. Very, he said bluntly. I scanned on the page quickly, finding a clause at the bottom that read, Cause of death, murdered by subject 16A. Who or what is 16A? I asked, hearing of this before. Something our agency uses to even the odds. His coy response wasn't lost on me and he quickly moved on for the topic. These other men were the original founding fathers of the cult of Kettle Moraine. These men were all murdered. His samples of each of these men's blood were found at what looked like remains of a ritual site, all of which took place at the black sites that I mentioned earlier. He let it sink in. We think the black-robed people were responsible. We think, well, we're pretty certain, actually. These guys not only killed the competition, but used them to birth these entities. Miles had no better words for them. But why? What's their game? We think that they're practicing, honing their witchcraft skills. Practicing for what, Keller? I asked. I don't think so. The first incident at Wolf Lake was in 04 and the bodies in Death Valley piled up in 03. The first incident reported in Redwood wasn't until 2012. No, they were honing their craft for a bigger play, a much bigger play. Miles coy tone was back. What bigger play? I didn't let this one slide. All in good time, James, all in good time. Now it's time for you to keep up your end of the bargain. Miles began to place the file back in the suitcase, and as he did, something caught my eye. The bottom of the page is sticking out from under that last profile. The profile had an image at the bottom. I could only see the bottom left corner of the image, but what I saw, it made my eyes bulge. The papers were snatched away and placed where I couldn't examine further, but I could swear that it was a foot. A huge, dark blue foot with sharp black talons for toenails. I was so mesmerized. I didn't even notice the vial of clear liquid and the large syringe that Miles pulled out of the suitcase. Whoa, what the heck is that? I demanded to know. This is what you agreed to do if I answered your questions. Miles countered. I don't think it's unreasonable to ask what you're putting in my arm. I won't lie, James, it's not exactly FDA approved. It's something our boys in our laboratory whipped up purposely for this. A metabolite mixture of LSD and DMT, combined with a sedative. By all accounts, this will induce a lucid dream. Then maybe we can see what we're dealing with here. Miles said, pulling out a laptop and an EpiPen. No, please no. It's taken me months to get back to a place where I'm not scared to close my eyes. Please don't make me go back in there. Please don't make me see him. I begged. Miles checked his watch. 10.20 p.m. Almost time to begin, he said, speaking to himself. Uh, Mr. Black, Miles, please. 
but my pleas fell on deaf ears. He opened up the laptop and double-clicked a PowerPoint icon labeled EK Inducement Exercise. No, James, I know how scary it is to face evil, but I do what I do because if I didn't, everyone on this planet would suffer. And this right here is no different. Gathered clearly as a thing for you. You go to ground for 12 weeks and he lashes out at Mr. Atwood, the head ranger, just like that thing did in Death Valley in 03. If we don't face this thing now, find out how to beat it. Then it won't be long before the town of Wolf Lake and likely many, many others begin to suffer. He made a strong case. Oh, what if I get into trouble? Well, that's what this is for. Miles said, holding with a pen filled with two whole milligrams of adrenaline. One hit of that could probably wake up Walt Disney on a warm day. Miles said with a smirk. You ready? He said, turning the laptop screen towards me. I was so nervous that I could barely speak, so I nodded. He tapped the space bar and an old film-style countdown initiated. As the timer reached one and the presentation begun, Miles began strapping up my bicep and waiting for a viable vein to appear. I wasn't the best with needles, so I remained to fix it on the laptop. The first image was Ed Keller's mugshot. The second, a crime scene photo of Keller and Wait Meats and the chamber of horrors within. Blood and sweat stained mattresses, children dripping from the machines, 19 pairs of kids' clothing stuffed under the floor. I stared in horror. It was all coming back. The Robertson kids, Chuck and his wife hanging from the tree, Danny Waldron being dragged off, the smell of Keller's breath on the back of my neck, the innocent children being picked out of his teeth right in front of me, Whatever was in that syringe was now in my bloodstream, and I slowly began to lose sight of the images in front of me. I faded to black. A whirlwind of colors and images swirled around my mind, like paint in a washing machine. I felt like I was in the fastest elevator on the planet, taking me to the highest room in the tallest building. I felt sick. I closed my eyes, trying not to vomit. A few minutes passed, but eventually everything settled down. When it all calmed, I decided to open my eyes. I was in the middle of the woods, and I could smell burning, burning flesh. I gathered all the courage that I could muster, and began making my way towards it.